I invite you at this time, if you would please take your copy of God's Word. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians this morning, 1 Corinthians the 11th chapter. And I'm going to reference some other passages, uh, Matthew 26, Matthew 28, but 1 Corinthians 11 will be our primary text. Thank you, um, Brother Glenn. Thank you all for the leading of the worship and preparing our hearts for the Scripture. As you find your place, it sure is good to have the Morrows back in their spot, right front and center. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Miss Kay, we've been praying for you. Brother Butch, we've been praying for you, and it's good to have you back in your spot. 1 Corinthians 11, have you found your place in God's Word? Let's go to the Lord and ask Him to bless the preaching of His Word. Would you pray with me once again? Lord, as we come to the point of looking into your eternal and errant Word, Father, it's my prayer that you would speak through me. Forgive us of the ways we failed you, Lord. Lord, as we look at this great passage and we contemplate Christ and the sacrifice, and Lord, through our faith in Christ, what that means for us, Lord, as we think of all of those elements, Lord, I just pray that they would come alive today, Lord, as we make Christ the center of everything we're doing. Lord, I pray again for the one here that's burdened today, Lord, maybe for the one that has not made that decision to trust you, that, Lord, this would be the day that they would trust you. Lord, in Jesus Christ's name, we ask all of this. Amen. Amen. Well, everything that we do today is going to center around Christ. And, you know, really there's three elements when we think of the Lord's Supper that, that need to be present, and all of them revolve around Christ. We need to think of the person of Christ. We need to remember the passion of Christ, and we need to remember the position of Christ. And, you know, saying that to you, really every worship service that we come together ought to center around Christ and those three aspects of Christ. And so certainly that's what will happen today. And I'm so thankful we have the Word of God. We, we don't have to question or guess what we're supposed to do as a believer, as a follower of Christ. The Word of God instructs us. And, you know, God doesn't put a premium on ignorance. And, and it, it, it must be astonishing to the angels, and, and it must break the heart of our Lord to, to, for, for them to realize just how often we neglect the Word of God. Folks, not only does the Word of God tell us the way to have a right relationship with God, to have that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, but do you realize every aspect of life, the way that we deal with one another, the way that we conduct our families, the way that we conduct our business life, the way that we conduct our church life, all of that is covered in the Word of God. There's no excuse not to understand what God wants us to do. And so before we get into the heart of the Lord's Supper, because that's what we're going to be talking about today, so often we observe this supper, but, but it may be that in our hearts and our minds, we don't really fully comprehend, or maybe we're confused on some of the elements as to why do we do this as a Baptist church. Well, there's two ordinances that we observe as a Baptist church. That's believer's baptism and the Lord's Supper. There's many ministries that we're a part of, but those are the two ordinances that we get from the Word of God that we are to observe as followers of Christ. And of course, both of them are beautiful. Both of them center around Christ. Baptism, of course, is our picture of dying and being resurrected with Christ. And the Lord's Supper is a beautiful picture of the sacrifice of what Jesus went through in, in purchasing our freedom from the bondage of sin. So both of them are to be observed in the church. Both of them are beautiful in and of themselves, and certainly they need to revolve around who Christ is. So that is what we're going to talk about. Now, 1 Corinthians is our text. I was serious about that, but I did tell you there was two passages I wanted to look at in Matthew, and, and Matthew 28 is one of those. You might recognize that already the latter part of that is being our great commission. Within that great commission, we are told what we need to do as a body of believers. And folks, before we can appreciate the Lord's Supper, before we can truly understand the elements of the Lord's Supper, we got to think about what it means to have a relationship with Christ. Because the Lord's Supper is to be observed by those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at Matthew 28. 
I love this passage. I very easily could have started in verse 16 because that's the heart of, of where it begins. But let's, let's move down to verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying... Now remember, this is after he's resurrected. He's talking to his disciples. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Here we go. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now here is the aspects that I want to pull out of this beautiful passage. You have heard me, church, say this. If you've heard me preach for any length of time, because I say it all the time, because I want to keep it in my mind, and it needs to be in the mind of the, of the believers that make up the church, is that our role as a follower of Christ is to make disciples. I don't care if you're a man, or if you're a woman, or if you're a boy, or if you're a girl, if you're rich, or you're poor, if you're a Jew or a Gentile as a believer, that does not matter. As a follower of Christ, the heart of what we're to do is to make disciples. Now, God gives us different talents to do it. Some of us are called to preach. Some of us are able to lead in music. Some of us are gifted teachers. Some of us are gifted with our hands. Some of us are gifted with our thoughts. Some of us are stronger in our faith. Some of us are stronger in prayer. Some of us are stronger in working in the forefront. Some of us are, are stronger in working behind the scene. But all of us, as believers in Christ, are to make disciples. So evangelism comes first. Then after a person gives their heart and life to Christ, which is the greatest decision that we'll ever make, amen? I mean, we pride ourselves on being good at what we do, right? We're good at our occupation. We're good at our jobs. We're, we're good at being parents. I don't know if anybody feels good at being parents all the time, but, but the things that we feel good at we pride ourselves, but you know what we need to really be concentrated on? How are we helping the lost understand they need Jesus? How are we, under, how are we helping those that are on the outside become part of the inside? Because that is the great commission that God has given us. So first and foremost is evangelism. And then after that, that precious man, that precious woman, that precious child... Ask Jesus Christ to come into their heart as Lord and Savior. What happens next? Scripture told us. What was the second aspect here? So we make disciples and then what do we do? We baptize them, don't we? Right? That was a trick question, wasn't it? Yes, it really was that simple. That is the next act of obedience. Baptism is not what saves. Can you go to heaven if you're not baptized? Absolutely. Faith in Christ and Christ alone is what saves us. But it is an act of obedience to identify with Christ in his death when we're buried under the water, in his life when he resurrected, we're raised out of the water to walk in newness of life. It is a visual picture to the world, the saved world, the lost world, that we are now identified with Christ. So we evangelize them, that's first, and then they're baptized. Now, y'all didn't get it right this time. What's the third thing we do? Lord's Supper's coming. You are correct. We teach them. We disciple them. That's what Scripture said here. Did I not just read that? All right, what do we do? We make disciples of all the nations. And, and, and he goes on to say What? baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here it is, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And of course, the Lord's always with us. He never leaves us to do this in and on our own ability. So we're to teach them the all things. Oh my goodness, the all things. If this sermon lasted 24 hours, I wouldn't scratch the surface of the things that we're to be taught. I think of the Word of God. Do you remember in Luke 22, verse 37, Jesus says the greatest commandment 
is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. That's the great commandment. That's, that's the first. What is the second? To love your neighbor as yourself. That's one of the all things that we have to be taught. We have to let the Holy Spirit work within us so that we love those that are unlovable, that we care for those who don't care in return. So that's one of the things. What's another all thing in the Scripture? Another all thing in the Scripture is pray. We're to be a people of prayer. Do you realize if we want to see the lost saved, if we want to see the saved on fire for God, if we want to see our church flourish, if we want to see our nation have revival, it will will not happen if we're not people of prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. You know what that means? We pray when we come together in public, and we pray in private. Sometimes we're alone at home, and we're in our prayer rooms, and we're on our hands and knees, or in our recliner, or whatever is our position of prayer, and we pray. But you know what? We're to be constantly in a mind of prayer. As we're driving down the road, as we see someone at a gas station, as we see someone at Walmart, as we think of a precious family member that is struggling, as we think of our nation, our leadership, we are to be a people of prayer. What's another all thing that we're to be doing? I'm just hitting, I'm just scratching the surface. I love Matthew 5, verse 16, that says that we're to let our light shine. We're not supposed to be Christians undercover. We're not supposed to be followers of Christ that doesn't tell anyone about that. Oh, I don't want to offend them. You ever have anyone knock on your door and they want to tell you about a faith that leaves Christ out of the center? Ever had that happen? Others that have not even placed their faith in Christ are out evangelizing. Bless their hearts. They don't have the truth, yet they understand that they need to to, to get out what they're trying to sell, I guess because they've got the mindset that good works will get you into heaven. But I think to myself, bless them, Lord. Help them. Help them to see the truth. They don't understand who Jesus Christ is, and yet they're knocking on doors. And I think to myself, We know the truth, but we don't want to offend anybody. My dear friend, I don't want to offend anybody either. I can't stand to think that I've upset anybody. I can't stand to think that I have caused anybody any pain whatsoever. Yet when they burn for eternity in hell, I bet they're going to wish that somebody had upset them. Just saying. There's a way to present the gospel in love. Jesus whether it was the woman caught in adultery or whether it was a crooked tax collector like Zacchaeus or whether it was a a highfalutin authority figure like Nicodemus, he knew how to love on all of those individuals right where they were, as Brother Glenn's saying, as broken people, he knew how to love and yet share the truth with them. Don't you think the Holy Spirit can do the same through us? It is not our place to save anybody. It is not our position to be able to help anyone or to be able to deliver anyone from the sin that they're in. Our responsibility is to give them Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do the work in them. All right, we got to get to the Lord's Supper, but this is foundational. Evangelism, baptism, teaching the doctrines that the Word of God has proclaimed is where we've got to be. And oh yes, you were correct, my dear sister, one of those things that we're to teach and to observe is the Lord's Supper. Move forward, if you would, back to 1 Corinthians. Of course, 1 Corinthians has its heart in Matthew 26. You remember on the eve of Jesus being crucified, he's observing the Passover with his disciples. Passover, that beautiful ceremony that was a a picture of 
Israel being delivered from Egyptian bondage. You remember the final plague. Remember the death angel passing over? And you remember they had to have the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. And if they had the blood of the lamb, their firstborn would be spared. But if you didn't have the blood of the lamb, do you remember what the curse was? Do you remember what the plague was? It was designed by God to bring Egypt to its knees, and that's exactly what it did. Israel had been in bondage there for centuries, and yet God was finally delivering his people. And if you didn't have the blood on the doorpost, the firstborn would die. From Pharaoh's house all the way down to the dungeon, it said. If you didn't have the blood on the doorpost... The firstborn would die. Not just of of, of mankind, but the firstborn of the animals would die. So that night there was a a particular way as they ate the roasted lamb and none of it could be left behind. What they didn't eat had to be burned. And and if you were a small family and, and couldn't have a lamb of your own, whoever your neighbor was, you would invite them over and you would share the lamb together and you would have the bitter herbs. And and all of it was going to be a picture of, of God miraculously delivering them from Egyptian bondage. And so for generations and generations, the Passover was observed. And so the eve of Jesus, the perfect, ultimate, sacrificial lamb, was there in that upper room we read in Matthew 26. And he's there with his disciples. And he's eating the Passover lamb. And there's common elements that would have been on the table. One is the bread. The other is the cup. And I think it's interesting because Scripture doesn't say it's wine. Scripture doesn't say it's grape juice. Now, we know the culture, and it most probably had to have been wine. But I think it's very interesting in Scripture that wine is not referred to. It's always referred to as the cup. So you have the bread on the table, and you have the cup. That was two important aspects of Passover, And there Jesus is. He knows that the next day at 3 o'clock, he's going to be dead in the tomb. And he's there with his disciples. And he's observing this Passover meal. And he's about to institute something new. Something glorious. Something that will point to himself as the ultimate sacrifice that would take the sins of the world away. And that is the Lord's Supper. Let's look in 1 Corinthians. Paul picks up on the theme, and there was a problem in the Corinthian church. Folks, don't ever think that there's a perfect church, right? Ooh, Brother Robert, did you just go there? Did you just go there? I think this is the closest to perfect I've ever had in a church. You can say amen. It's a wonderful, loving fellowship here. There's ministry that takes place even when the pastor can't be a part of it. My goodness, I could go on the rest of the day bragging on how God has blessed and used this church. But churches have trouble, and the church in Corinth had trouble. So Paul writes this letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and there's two things he's concerned about concerning the Lord's Supper. First of all, in verse 23 through verse 26, he wants the church to understand the significance of the Lord's Supper. And then you get to verse 27, and he wants them to understand the seriousness of the Lord's Supper. So let's begin with the significance. Look at it here, verse 23. For I received from the Lord. Now remember, he had been in Corinth. He had been talking to the church. He had, he had, this is a letter to remind them of things they already knew. And he said, for I received from the Lord... That which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Now how did Paul receive this? He says he received it from the Lord. We know the disciples are the original recipients because they were part of that Passover meal where the Lord instituted it. But we also know Paul was a very special person as well. We know that before he was a believer, he was very zealous. He loved God. He was a God-fearer. He he was a, a, a Pharisee. I mean, he was a Jew of Jews, the Hebrew of Hebrews. 
And as Saul of Tarsus on that Damascus road, the one that he had been persecuting so, the Lord Jesus Christ, he had an encounter with the risen Lord, and his life was changed forever. So we know, which by the way, who wrote most of the New Testament? The Apostle Paul. We know that Paul received divine intervention from God. We know that the Lord spoke to him. So the Lord had reminded him of this. And no doubt the the apostles had talked to him about the experience. And so Paul is telling the church, I know what I'm talking about, guys. Here is what you need to understand about the Lord's Supper. Now I mentioned earlier the person the passion, and the position of Christ. That's what we see here. It begins with the person. So they're sitting there, and and, and, and there's two elements. As I mentioned earlier, the bread and the cup. And, And so when we think of the person of Christ, Paul is reminding them of what Jesus told his disciples there on that Passover before he's going to be crucified. Paul is reminding them of those two elements, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Now, you can imagine the astonishment of the, of the disciples when they're there with Jesus, as is recorded in Matthew 26, when Jesus is pointing out these elements, and Paul is almost quoting in here verbatim. And, and, and first of all, we talk about the bread. Look at how it was worded, folks. Think of the significance here. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, right? That's before Judas did the scheme that he did. The Sanhedrin was waiting on Judas. Judas went and reported. The mob came. The trial started. Pilate got involved. Ultimately, Jesus was mutilated and beaten and and nailed to a cross. On the night that all of that took place, what does it say? He took bread Now, there would have been nothing insignificant about that. That's pretty insignificant, actually. Bread was very common in any meal, especially at the Passover meal. And and, and, and goodness, what do we know about bread in Jesus? He's the bread of life. But do you remember in Matthew 14 when Jesus is on that mountainside teaching all those people and the disciples say, Jesus, it's getting late in the afternoon. Look, preaching time should be over. Send them home to eat. And what did Jesus say to the disciples? Astonishment. Oh, don't send them home. You give them something to eat. (laughs) What? We have five loaves and two fish here. What did Jesus do? He blessed it, and the five loaves and the two fish did what? Fed 5,000 men. They didn't even count the women and children. And Scripture says there were 12 basketfuls of fragments left over. So Jesus is there, and he takes this bread in his hand, and it was customary for the master of the ceremony to break the bread. It was a loaf of bread. And then you passed it around, and everyone at the table broke off another piece of it. So as the bread went around, it was mutilated. By the time it got to the last participant, it would have been just a fragment. Everybody that tore the bread was doing more damage to it. And look at what Jesus says about that bread. He says, as Paul reminds us, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So what is Jesus saying here? In a very real, now we don't believe that the bread and the wine literally become the the body and the blood of Christ. But it is a beautiful symbol of Christ. And as Christ took the bread and broke it, and he passed it around and the disciples broke it. Can you imagine the picture that that would have been? Because he tells them, this is my body. Look at what's happening to it. It's what I'm going to do for you on the cross. Now, we know there were no bones in Jesus' body broken during the whole ordeal. John tells us that, that his bones were not broken. So when, when the text here is talking about broken, it means that the body of Christ was mutilated in such a way that it was broken. Think about all that they did to him. They they slapped him. They punched him. They scourged him to the bone. They ripped his beard out of his cheek. And then they nailed his hands and feet to the cross. 
Jesus, in a real way, is saying to them, as you break this bread, it is a picture of my broken body. My Father loves you so that he's sending me the only perfect sacrifice to Calvary's cross so that you can have a right relationship with God. So when we take this bread, and I know it won't be a, a loaf of bread, but the picture is the same. We're to think of Christ and how much he loved us and what he went through so that we, as broken people, could have forgiveness and not only a home in heaven, but that we could have the most comforted, peaceful life in spirit here on earth. We got time for a word picture here. I use this a lot, but why did I begin in Matthew 28 saying we had to make disciples? Because that comes first. If we've not trusted Christ, then we can't relate to this yet. So we want to make sure everybody here has trusted Christ. You know what? I've used this illustration, and you can use it in your witnessing, and you don't even have to have a track to use it. Think of God on one side on a mountain. Think of humanity on the other side of mountain, because that is where we are. Scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God is holy. There's not even a hint of sin around him. Never could there be. Never will there be. And God is way over there. And, and, and we, we want to get to God because there's something inside of us that tells us, I need God. But in our own ability, we don't quite understand that, do we? So we want to get to God and we use our good works. Here's what we think. And we don't even think this. I don't think we consciously realize that oh, I'm going to try to get to God by doing something good. But yet it just kind of comes out. And we think, well, you know, I think I should be a good neighbor. My neighbor is hard to get along with. My neighbor drives me crazy. But I think it would be what God would want. So I'm going to be good to my neighbor. And we begin to lay the bridge down of being kind to our neighbor. And we put the planks down. And we think, oh, it looks so sturdy. It looks so secure. This is going to get me to God because I'm being good to my neighbor neighbor. And oh, then we think, well, you know, I should be a good mom and a good daddy. I think that'll be good for God. I'm going to be the best parent and the best spouse that I can be. Oh, you know what? That church needs a little money. I think that preacher's crazy, but you know, I think it'll get in good with God if I put a little money in the plate and we lay a few more planks trying to get to God and we feel so good about ourselves and we look at our bridge and we think, man, that's going to get me to God because I'm doing what I need to be doing. And then we start a cross and it don't get us to God. It may make us feel good in the inside for a moment. It may get us the praise of men and women, but it just won't get us to God. And then one day by a miracle, because a pastor's been preaching, a mama's been praying, a neighbor's been witnessing, God has been wooing, orchestrating the paths of our lives so that we'll see who Christ is, we realize that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. And we understand that we need Jesus. That if we invite Him into our heart, we don't have to clean our lives up to come to Him. We invite Him in and He'll clean us up. He'll make us new. He'll make the way we think new. He'll make the things we used to do that were for sin be repulsive to us and the things that we used to make fun of we want to do now like pray and study the Bible and worship with other people and finally when we ask Jesus to come into our heart somehow or another he's the bridge that don't shake he's the bridge that won't fall in and we're in the arms of God for all of eternity that's how it works folks Jesus said this bread is a symbol of my body. And did you notice? Did you notice this? Did you notice that God, the Lord here, Jesus Christ, gave thanks? He knew he was about to be beaten. He knew they were going to pull his beard out and spit on him. He knew he was going to be nailed hand and foot to that cross. 
and, and people would come by and ridicule him and mock him and probably throw things at him. He knew all of that was coming. He knew the agony that his body was going with, to have to withstand, not to mention the weight of the world's sins on his shoulders. He knew all of that, and praise God, he thanked God for it. How in the world do we explain that? I think it'll take us all of eternity to understand it. You know why he thought God was thanking God for it? Because he looked ahead, and he knew when his work was finished on the cross, and he was placed in that borrowed tomb, that he wasn't going to stay there. That on the third day, he was going to resurrect, and that he would have victory. And that through faith in him, we would have victory over sin, death, and the grave. And he was thanking God that God was giving humanity another chance to, to get right what Adam and Eve messed up in the Garden of Eden. Likewise, the cup. We're still talking about the person of Christ, the emblem of his body, which is the bread, now the emblem of the blood, which is the wine. Look at verse 25, and I have to hasten. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, that's the person of Christ, the shedding of blood. As we partake of the cup, we're remembered, we remember that the only way to have forgiveness of sin is through the shedding of the Lord Jesus Christ's blood. See, that, that, that had been practiced through the Old Testament for centuries. I mean, there was an endless flow of blood from the temple, from all the animals that had to be sacrificed, and yet that never gave lasting peace. That was a picture of the ultimate sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, when Christ died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Meaning the wrath between us and God, the penalty had been paid to make it take account and effect for us today. All we have to do is place our faith in Christ. Christ died on the cross 2,000 years so that we could have eternal life. So that every sin, past, present, and future could be forgiven. So that we would have the courage and the words to tell other people about Jesus. So we would be able to use our talents for the furtherance of the kingdom. And then we have the passion of Christ. Remember, every Lord's Supper, every worship supper should center around the person of Christ, what he did on the cross, how he resurrected, what the shedding of his blood means to us. And then we have the passion here, first part of 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Isn't that something? Every time the broken body the shedding of the blood, the drinking of the cup. It's a picture, and we remember what Christ did for us. Not only is it the person and the passion of Christ, our worship should tell of the position of Christ. Because where is he today? My, my, our beautiful cross has not made it back since Christmas. I was going to use it as my illustration, but it's not there. It's in the corner. There it is. Do you see it? Everybody look at the cross. You see it over here? That rugged cross that is an emblem of beauty to us because it reminds us of what Christ did. But to the first century here, it was an emblem of torture and shame. Look at it. It's got a beautiful cloak hanging on it. But do you see the body of Christ? He ain't there. He was there, but he died. And he was buried, and he rose victorious on the third day. That's what the latter part of verse 26 reminds us. Not only is the person of Christ to be remembered, the passion of Christ as he died on the cross and resurrected, but also the position. Look at it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till what? Till he comes. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. You know it's the next thing on God's calendar. We don't know when it is. People want to write books and speculate 
and try to do mathematical equations. And I think even if they got it right, God wouldn't come on that date because God says no one knows the hour. The Father will say when it's time, and when it's time, the Lord will come back. The dead in Christ will rise. We who remain will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. We'll go and be with the Lord. We'll be given our glorified bodies, and we'll reign with Christ. I'm going to tell you what. You keep that in your mind and it'll get you through the lowest of lows. The position of Christ. He's not on the cross today. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father in power. And He knows everything that's going on in our lives. He knows our very thoughts. He knows the number of hairs that are on our head. He knows every tear that we shed. He knows whether we love Him or whether we don't love Him. My dog Daisy May. We'll take her to get her groomed because she's the type of poodle that has to be clipped. All poodles have to be clipped, but she's three parts. Part of it's poodle. And we pay good money for that. And they'll put a little bow on her and she'll come back and she'll smell so good. And she'll look so pretty. And I let her out in the backyard. And the first thing that she does is lay on her back and waller in the grass. This morning, I let her out to do her business, a normal thing for her. Usually, she'll go out, and within a minute or two, she's back at the door wanting to come back in. What does she do? She doesn't come back. She's at the edge of the yard barking, having a fit. I think to myself, good Lord, she's going to wake all of the neighbors up. And then I think, good, they need to be in church. And she's out there having a fit. And why on earth is she doing that? Why is she wallowing in the grass when I paid a fortune to have her groom? Because she's a dog. That's what dogs do. Why is she out there barking? She was barking at the neighbor's dog. Why was she barking? Because it's what dogs do. We do what we do because we are who we are. If you belong to Christ... You may get out of track, you may get off the road, but you ain't going to stay there because you have been redeemed. You have been bought at a price. You belong to Christ. So my dear friend, this is our invitation. And then we're going to absorb, absorb, we're going to observe the supper. We're going to absorb it too. But this is important. Is God here? And are you over here? Yes, God, see her. Thank you. But in my illustration here, have you made it to God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, is the way? As a matter of fact, the Bible says He's the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. No matter how clever, how smart, creative we can be, if we give our body to be burned to help somebody, hallelujah for that. But if we haven't received Christ, we're lost. You do what you do because you are who you are. Maybe somebody here today has been pretending. We know the Christian language, and Mom and Daddy taught us how to be polite, and we, and we know enough about Christian lingo that we can look the part, but I'm going to tell you, God looks into your heart right now, and He's saying, think of that bread that's broken. I did that for you. Think of the wine here in the cup. That's the blood that I shared for you. I love you. I've got a plan and purpose for you. Will you receive me? I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do His work. I'm not going to say anything else, but I'm going to have a prayer. Brother Glenn, you come. We're going to sing one verse. Now, here's what you're tempted to do. I don't need to come forward because we're having the Lord's Supper and we're going to run out of time. I'd hate for you to die out here on 31 or have a heart attack or something happen and you step out into eternity and your heart's not right. We're fixing to have our hymn of invitation, but I said there's two parts to this. 23 through 26 deal with the significance of the Lord's Supper. What does 27 through 30 deal with? The seriousness of the Supper. Do you know why Paul wrote this to the Corinthians? We, 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 it's, it's one reason. They were not thinking of Christ when they observed the Supper. You know what they were thinking about? each other. The rich were eating all the food and drinking all the wine and the poor believers wasn't getting anything. And Paul was just outraged. He said, Jesus Christ died for everyone. There's no Jew or Gentile. How is it you're doing this? This ain't the Lord's Supper you're observing. And you know what he tells him? You can read it in verse 30. He said, when you take this in an unworthy manner, some of you are sick and some of you are asleep. What did he mean by asleep? They had died. 
That's how serious this is. We don't make a mockery of what Christ did because he loves us so. Our hymn of invitation, do you need Christ? Search your hearts right now and be free of sin. Okay, let me pray for you. Lord, this is our hymn. Lord, as, as, as we sing this first note, I pray if someone here needs Christ, that they will come forward. Lord, if someone needs to make any commitment, that they will just make it, Lord. Because to follow you is where peace and happiness comes, even in the midst of this hard world that we're in. Lord, I pray for each of us, Lord, as we remember what you did on the cross. Lord, help us never to forget the great love and the great sacrifice and the great life that we've been given because of faith in you. Yes. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.